So today I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Neil McRoberts. He's a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis and also an affiliate advisor with the UC Statewide IPM program. Today, he's going to be speaking on decision thresholds, the fatal attraction at the heart of IPM. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass this over to Neil. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks for the introduction and, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you to you all for uh, being with us this afternoon. Your attendance is very much appreciated. Um, so uh, this afternoon, I'm, I'm gonna talk about decision thresholds, which of course, are an important component of IPM and have been um, almost as for as long as the subject of IPM itself has existed. So um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is, is um, really cover two broad areas. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the history and, and some basic concepts connected with IPM and the use of thresholds for decision making in IPM. Um, I'm going to remind people, maybe it's been a long time since you, you uh, first heard about these ideas, so I'm going to remind everybody what the basic components are um, that go into being able to use thresholds for decision making when it comes to pest management. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about um, just touching on the subject of evaluation of um, decision tools and decision thresholds. So if you're using them, how do you know that they're working? How do you collect the information that would let you evaluate whether they're doing the job that you think they're doing? Um, and then towards the end of the, the presentation, I'm actually going to touch on the subject area that um, is really where the title of the talk comes from, which is to um, ask, some ask some difficult questions about thresholds. Um, particularly in the way that they might be used, um, not, um, not so much uh, for individual decision making by uh, pest control advisors and growers, but more in the way that, that IPM is, is increasingly being used um, or advocated as a policy tool um, to, uh, to deliver goals that perhaps are lie at a bigger scale than, than individual farming enterprises and I'm, and so the, the tough questions really are addressed at that scale. Do, is, is the use of thresholds appropriate for delivering some high level policy objectives that, that, may, that may be of interest to um, institutions like the Department of Pesticide Regulation or CDFA? So I'm going to take you back to uh, the very beginnings of the concept of thresholds. And, and um, unlike some areas of science, we can really say pretty clearly where, where, the, where, we, where the modern conception of, of economic thresholds and um, damage really started in IPM. And it can be traced back to this publication um, in, the, in the journal Hilgardia. Um, Hilgardia no longer exists, but you can think of it as basically the precursor to what today is called California agriculture. So um, Hilgardia was published up until about 1995. Um, and we're very lucky that, that UC um, actually ran a digitization project a few years ago. And so the entire run of this old venerable journal is available um, from the 50s all the way through to the, the mid 90s. And in um, one of the volumes of Hilgardia published in 1959, this paper appeared um, written by uh, Stern and colleagues, um, which really lays out, lays out the beginnings of um, the, the entire area of the use of economic thresholds and economic injury levels in pest management. So if you want to go back to the source material for all of this, then this is the, this is the paper to, to go and look at. And that, that link in red on the slide there will take you to the actual, the PDF file um, in the repository that will let you call up the original journal. So that the screenshot here is, is the, uh, the, the cover of the, the paper. And, I, and I, I pulled this um, figure out of the paper. This is actually figure three from the original paper from 1959. And in this, this um, very, uh, very much freehand drawn figure from the 50s, you can, you can see a lot of the, the, the concepts for IPM and for decision thresholds laid out. And I'm gonna make use of this figure a couple of times as we go through, through the, the, the presentation this afternoon. 
but you can see the the squiggly line represents um, some kind of notional pest population oscillating up and down over time, and the dashed line that runs across the um, the, the figure is it trying to indicate that there's some threshold population size above which the pest would become damaging and where we would try and take action to prevent that population level being reached. And then these uh, disks that kind of are floating in space above the line are, are indicating that at different population sizes, if you were able to look at the, the population in space distributed over a, an area, say in an orchard block or a, a field or over a landscape, then you would find that even if the average value of the population size is represented by the peak, that if you looked in more detail, you would see that there was variation in space in, in the numbers of insects uh, that you would find if you went out and looked for them. And we're gonna come back to that topic in more detail later in the, the presentation when I talk about sampling uh, and and the, the some of the interesting things that happen when we actually go out and count uh, bugs in practice. So that's a broad overview of where, where the history of the subject lies. Um, some, some famous names on that paper uh, from several of the UC campuses uh, back then. But where we're gonna spend most of our time this afternoon is, is thinking about these three topics that are, are identified in blue on this slide. Um, and these are really the fundamentals that Stern and his colleagues laid out in that 1959 paper. And it's a testament to the remarkable conceptual work that they did back then, that really these concepts haven't changed since that original paper. They pretty much nailed the ideas straight out of the box. Um, and although we've, we've over time been able to um, refine some of them and add a few more uh, tweaks and, and bells and whistles, really the basics of this subject haven't changed since that original paper. So there are three kind of closely related topics that are important and, and certainly a couple of them quite often get mixed up and confused. Um, and so at least part of what today's presentation is all about really is just um, a revision exercise for some of you to go back over these three things and really make sure that, that um, the, you've got it clear what, what the different labels refer to. So. The first one, the economic damage, is, is the basic concept that at some level of, of pest population intensity, the pest, a, a pest will cause damage which will justify management action being taken. Um, management action specifically aimed at reducing the population size of that pest, managing it to a level where it, it's, it doesn't have any economic impact or reduce the economic yield of the crop that, that we're thinking about. So the economic damage as a concept really is the fundamental issue here. Um, and then on top of that foundation, we have two further concepts and these two quite often get confused. So the economic injury level, the EIL, as it's sometimes called, is is not a value of money. That's the, for, the first fundamental thing to, to get clear. It's a measure of pest population size or level of pest uh, activity. And it's that population size or level of activity that corresponds to the first kind of measurable economic damage. So what's the, the level of the pest population that causes an economic impact? And that's the economic injury level. Okay, so it's a measure of pest population size. And then somewhat confusingly, the economic threshold is the pest population size. So it's another measure of pest population size, but it's the pest population size at which you have to take action in order to prevent the pest population reaching the economic injury level. Okay, so... Um, the best way to think about this is with um, with pest populations being dynamic and growing in time, uh, usually. Um, then if you want to prevent a pest from reaching uh, the level where it's going to cause 
uh, an impact, you have to take action before it gets there, before your your estimate of the population reaches the, the injury level, so that you stop it from reaching the injury level. So the economic threshold is a, a lower pest population threshold at which you take action to prevent the pest population from reaching the economic injury level. Okay, so it's easy to see why those two things might get confused, um, particularly if you're not dealing with them day in, day out, and thinking about what they mean in a lot of detail. So um, we can show um, in a couple of graphs what the relationship is between those two things. Um, so on the, on the left-hand figure, as you look at the slide, um, we're looking at the the pet some notional pest population increasing, that's the red line, increasing from a low number early in the season or early in a series of years. And as the pest population grows, um, maybe exponentially to start with because it's at low density and there's not much crowding and food's readily available, then the pest population crosses the economic threshold. And, it, and if we're sampling and surveying to, to measure how much um, pest pressure there is, we would see that, that the, the pest reaches the economic threshold and that would trigger us to take action. And then if maybe we're not very successful in our actions, perhaps we don't do the right thing, we use the wrong pesticide or, or we just don't do the job well, then the pest population would continue to increase and eventually it would cross the economic injury level. So that would be the population size at which we would actually see an economic impact and damage, economic damage would occur. And then of course, if we weren't controlling the pest, the population may continue to increase or other factors may, may bring it down. Um, if there are natural enemies or that, that may kick in, then they may act in a system uh, to, to reduce the size. Okay, so that's kind of thinking about things in terms of pest dynamics and shows the relationship between those two concepts that we're interested in. But what, another way to think about this is that we can take that red line and kind of stretch it out and make it into a scale of its own. So now on the horizontal axis, we're thinking about the pest population size going from a very low level at the left-hand end and increasing as it goes towards the arrowhead at the right hand end. And now we can put the value of the crop lost on the vertical scale and look at the relationship between those two things in a, in a different way. And so now if we were to put the economic threshold on the pest population size axis, it would be represented by this vertical green line here. And then we would, we would extrapolate across and see what the value of the crop being lost would be at the economic threshold. So there would be some loss probably at the economic threshold, but the point of course is that, that at that point, it's not, it's not more than the cost of doing any treatment or management actions that are required for control. And then at this higher population size, of course, there's a higher level of damage. And if we get there, that's when we would see the economic damage that we're interested in. So again, just to reinforce this point, the economic injury level is, is, a, is measured in terms of the pest population. The damage is measured in terms of the value of the crop. And that blue, uh, that blue square there shows you the relationship between the economic damage and um, the economic injury level. Okay, so um, if we want to put this concept of this economic threshold for making decisions into practice, then we need to think about three components. There's, and the first one that we need to think about is the damage function. And the damage function um, sounds fancy or compli complicated, but really all, it's, all it is is the idea that um, essentially that as the pest population gets bigger, then the probability of, of damage to the crop or the plants that we want to protect gets bigger. And as the pest population increases, the level of damage is likely to go up as well. So in very broad terms, the idea of a damage function just says there's some correlation between 
the amount of pest pressure in the crop and the amount of damage that those pests will do. And um, in terms of what that relationship might look like, then the figure on the right hand side of the slide shows some, some potential different um, shapes that the damage function might take. And that really, um, and all of these shapes have been observed at one time or another in real life examples. So sometimes like you think the simplest relationship is, is a straight line. So basically, like which is shown by the heavy straight line in the middle of the figure. So basically, as the pest population size increases, more or less in direct proportion, the level of damage, the value of the crop that's lost goes up. And that sometimes happens with some pests. Um, there are other cases where shown by say this lower curve that I'm following with the cursor right now where you don't see very much damage over quite a wide range of low pest population sizes but then as the pest population increases the damage starts to accelerate. Um, you have the opposite kind of case where um, a lot of damage occurs early on but then as more pests arrive each new increment of pest increase causes less um, relative damage, maybe because the pests compete very strongly with each other so that their individual effect um, isn't as big proportionally when there's lots of them. And then you can have more complex relationships like this kind of um, S-shaped uh, curve in the middle where it's kind of a mixture of, of those other two examples. So you don't see much happening early on and then there's a, a range of pest population sizes where damage increases quite uh, rapidly with each new increment in pest population. And then maybe again, because they compete with each other, um, you see a relatively less effect towards the high end of the scale. So all of those, all of those different um, uh, issues uh, can happen. Um, but I just want to kind of bring things back to a fairly simplistic level. And this is the only kind of bit of arithmetic or algebra in the whole presentation. Um, so just to get over the basic idea of, of what's involved in working out for any individual case, roughly at what, at what kind of level of damage um, the, you're likely to, to want to to set your economic threshold and, and think about the economic injury level. And really the components of this are very, very simple. So if we think about things on an area basis, so let's say that for any particular crop, it, and it could be a, an orchard crop or a, or a field crop, a broad acre crop, there's, there's some cost in X dollars per acre that it's gonna cost us to, um, to, con to apply a control. That might be a pesticide or it might be some other control method. And then we can say um, that there's an that uh, there's uh, for each incremental increase in the pest population size or pest pressure that we lose a small fraction of the value of the crop. OK, and that's really what these graphs on the right hand side are showing us. Okay, so those that that those kind of those things set up the balance between the cost of control and the damage that the pest will cause, and then we can think about the the the, the hopefully the the value of the crop if we're lucky and there's no pest present or if um, pest control is very successful. So there's some value of the crop, um, Z dollars per acre, and that could be and obviously that's going to vary depending on what kind of crop it is. Okay, so the simplest way we can think about working out the economic injury level is to start with the ratio of the cost of treatment to the value of the crop. So what fraction, what fraction of the crop's value relates to the cost of treatment? Okay, so X dollars divided by Z dollars. Okay, and then what we want to know is what pest population is equal to that that value. So how many increments of, of pest population increase do we need and before the pest will cause a, a loss in value that's equal to the cost of treatment? 
because obviously the basic concept here is that if the pest population is is low, the damage is low, and it may be that the pest's damage uh, is less than the cost that you would incur by making the treatment. And if that's the case, then there's no economic justification to do the treatment, whether that's a pesticide application or some other kind of intervention. So in order to find out the answer there, in these simplistic terms, what we need to say is that the ratio between the cost of treatment and the value of the crop should be equal to the increments of loss caused by some population size of the pest, which is this value N that we want to find. And so a little bit of um, algebra tells us that what we need to do is divide both sides by Y, which is the fraction of the crop that we lose for each increment increase in the pest population. So we can find out what that is by solving this, this little equation here. So it's the, the ratio of the cost of treatment to the value of the crop divided by the fractional loss in value for each increment increase in the pest population size. So that's the simplest way to think about it, but obvious, and that would correspond really to this linear relationship in the middle of the graph on the right hand side. If you're unlucky and you have one of these more complicated relationships, then there are more complicated uh, formulae that we could use to work out what the economic injury level is. But that calculation in the box there shows you the basic concepts of what it is that you're trying to do if you need to work out what your economic injury level is. Um, and of course, one thing that's immediately apparent from all of this is that this isn't going to be the same every year. You know, particularly if, it, you know, as crop prices, as crop values go up and down with market conditions, then the value of Z is going to go up and down each year. Um, you know, if, if, you know, if you're a processing tomato grower this year, you know, the contract prices are the highest that they've been for a long time. So the value of Z in that crop this summer is, is relatively high. Um, the cost of treatment may also go up and down quite a bit from season to season, depending on availability and competition for purchase of pesticides. So that, that can vary as well. So this isn't going to be a static thing that's going to stay the same over long periods of time. And sometimes in practice, we, we forget that um, these things are not constant and it's easy to kind of just stick with historical values for thresholds that people worked out at some point in the past and, and not come back and revise them as prices and costs uh, change or as, as, as pest profiles change and levels of damage fluctuate, then that will also have an impact on the economic threshold and the economic injury level. So what we're trying to do with economic threshold is control the pest population size before it reaches this value N so that we don't get to the point where we suffer the um, economic loss at the injury level. Okay, so just a quick uh, example to, to point out that, as I said earlier, all of this is very dependent on the idea that pest population sizes are, are extremely dynamic um, so quick reminder of the earlier graph up, up here on the left hand side, um, but just to give you a real world example of, of how dynamic pest population sizes can be, here, here are some uh, trap uh, assessments of Asian citrus psyllid populations, and obviously we're interested in ACP, the Asian citrus psyllid, not so much because it's a pest really in its own right, but because it's a vector for the HLB pathogen, but so here are some trap trap uh, incidence values from yellow panel traps from different areas of the state over uh, a period of about five years from 2015 to 2020, and you can see the different seasons are indicated by the colours of the points on on those on those uh, figures, and you can see 
that 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 um, hand drawn figure from the Air, from the Hilgardia paper was actually not a bad representation of pe of insect populations squiggling up and down over time. Um, and then this this brightly coloured panel here um, just shows um, uh, based on on um, controlled environment study work the the relative suitability of different areas of the world for the Asian citrus psyllid based on what we know about their temperature range, um, their lower and upper temperature bounds. And you can see there's a there's a bunch of areas from the San Joaquin Valley, from Riverside, San Bernardino, Ventura, and those are then compared with um, um, areas from uh, Texas and from um, from Brazil in the southern hemisphere, which is wh um, wh why they're, they're kind of in reverse. So just to make the, the, the point that pest populations, of course, as you all know, are very dynamic and that the dynamics are driven by things like temperature. And it's very obvious in the case of our, our, uh, our invasive Asian citrus psyllid, why the populations, say, in the Imperial Valley are so much lower than, say, they are in, in, uh, in Ventura here. And this, these big black areas in the middle of the temperature profile for Imperial and Eastern Riverside in the middle of the summer indicate periods when it's it's actually too hot for the ACP to um, to survive. And there's probably some summer heat mortality for the insect down in the desert there in the middle of summer. Okay, so just reinforcing the idea that that the environment drives pest dynamics and that makes the whole issue of, of thresholds and, and decision making um, a lot more complicated for us. So I mentioned um, at, the, at the beginning of the, 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 the talk, um, this, when, I, when we looked at this figure from that original paper, that, the, that Stern and his colleagues, even back then, um, recognized that um, the variation in pest populations in space over a landscape or across the area of an orchard block or in a field was an important thing for us to pay attention to. And even when pest population sizes reach relatively high levels, they're not going to be consistently at a high level everywhere in an area that we might be interested to protect. So in biology and um, in biology and in statistics, when we're thinking about something that we want to measure, when we're thinking about the fact that it can vary in some way, then we use the word variance to refer to that, that particular kind of variation. Okay, and in, this is an important concept um, and we could, we, could, we could have a whole 10 week course on the statistical theory of sampling and how to design sampling plans um, where we would dig into this in a lot more detail. But, but for the purposes of this afternoon, all that we really need to think about is the idea that more variation, so more variance in population size across space has two important um, implications for um, the practicality of using evidence-based decision-making. For so In other words, if we go out and collect scouting data or sampling data to estimate a population, a pest population, to decide if it's above the economic threshold or not, then we have to be aware of a couple of important implications from the, the existence of variance in this pest population size. Um, more variance means that um, we need to have a bigger sample size if we want to get a particular level of precision in our estimate. Okay, so so common terminology that you might hear kicked around would be that we want to be um, we want to have a confidence interval of ninety five percent around the estimate that we make of the population size. If there's if the pest population is very variable across the landscape, in other words, if there's high variance, then our sample size generally needs to be bigger to get that level of confidence. The other way to think about it, the flip, the flip side, which actually turns out to be more important in most practical situations, is that um, for reasons of limitations of money and time, 
and labor availability, usually um, what happens is that people have a fixed amount of effort that they're able to make to collect the information. And so what the variation in the pest population across the landscape does is make that make our estimates have greater or less precision for, for a fixed amount of effort that we're able to put into sampling. Okay, so that's another thing to be aware of when we're thinking about using thresholds and thinking about economic injury levels to trigger taking action. The more variable the pest is over space, the more, um, the more, the lower the precision of our estimate is going to be. And so, um, in this, in the box with in the green box with the numbers in it, I just kind of tried to illustrate um, numerically what that what the diagram from the, the original paper is really saying. So all these all these little peaks in these discs with the black caps on them would really correspond to numbers that might look something like this if we were to draw it out as a grid. And so if we went across the, if we went across this landscape um, of counting the number of pests present at each one of these places where there's a peak, we might end up with a table of numbers that looks something like the, the boxes with the green here. And, and obviously the more, the darker the green shading, the higher the pest pressure would be in that, in that box. So that's really what the, the diagram, in case anybody didn't get what the diagram is trying to show, it's really, it's making that point. The only other thing that I really want to say about sampling and sampling theory um, this afternoon is that any, sta any sampling plan is really uh, uh, described by what's called the operating characteristic curve. Um, and the operating characteristic curve is, is usually takes the shape something like the blue line here that I've drawn on this graph. It varies from example to example. It varies from pest to pest and context to context. But the axes of the, 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 um, the graph are always the same. So on the horizontal axis, we've got the actual pest incidence. So what, what proportion of places where we look for the pest would we be would we find it in reality and obviously that goes from zero to one and then on the on the vertical scale we've got the probability um that we would decide not to do anything about the pest given the actual pest incidence so you can see when the pest incidence is low here then the probability that we would decide not to take action is high that was just what you would hope, right? If the pest's largely absent, then you would want a very high probability that you would conclude that you didn't need to do anything. And at the opposite end of the scale, when the pest pre prevalence is very high, um, then the probability that you would decide not to take action would be zero or close to zero, which is also what you would want. And so from up here to down here, then how that blue line connects those two points is really determined by the type of pest that it is, how easy it is to find when we sample for it, how accurate our sampling is, how much effort we put into sampling. So all of those different factors plus many more would determine which kind of blue line we would get. But they all have something in common, which is kind of unwelcome, which is that right at the point when you, you're around the economic threshold. So again, that would be measured in terms of the pest population. That's where the probability is about 50-50-50 that you're gonna decide whether you should take action or not. And it sounds kind of contradictory, right? That the highest uncertainty about what to do happens when you're at the economic threshold. That sounds, you wouldn't expect that maybe to be the case, but then if you think about it in a little bit more detail, it really it really does make sense, right? Because you've, you've got a threshold number that you're, that's gonna act as the trigger where you're gonna decide either you need to do something or you're okay not to do something. And obviously the closer your estimate, the sample estimate that you get when you go out and count 
the little critters in the field is, the closer it is to the threshold, the more uncertain you're going to be about whether it's really above that number or really below that number. Okay, so um, it's an unwelcome um, and sometimes overlooked uh, 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 feature of sampling that, that, that this is kind of one of the laws of probability, unfortunately, that our highest uncertainty is right around the economic threshold. It's not when the pest population is really low and it's not when the pest population is really high because we can usually tell pretty obviously when those two things are the case. Um, it's right around the economic threshold. Um, so that's something to bear in mind if you're considering the idea of using thresholds for pest management is that um, they don't always lead you to feel more certain about how many pests are out there. Um, if you go out and count things, you quite often end up less sure than before you start. So um, it's it's sometimes a false uh, sense of hope thinking that that um, doing this stuff leads to certainty. It quite often leads to better pest management, but it, but along with that comes, uh, sometimes comes uncomfortable amounts of uncertainty. So here's just a simple case study. This, in this case, um, from drawn from work that we do on virus management in Grapevine, um, in this case, in in the upper San Joaquin Valley. And in this case, the pest control advisor who was working with us asked us to help um, design a sampling plan. And as I referred to earlier, this was a case where there was a fixed budget for testing the samples that were collected. And the question was really, if we're gonna spend this much money, then this is the biggest number of tests that we can afford to do for, the, for, for two viruses. So how should we best divide up our effort across um, this this um, complicated shape of block of, of grapes that to best you make use of the sampling resources that we're going to put in. And this illustrates a couple of general principles when you when you're thinking about that kind of question. In general, it's a good idea to start out a sampling exercise like that by drawing some kind of shape across the block. In this case, we suggested a W pattern. And then to collect your samples from the points on that on that um, pattern, okay. Now, obviously, this being grapevine, you can't walk in that pattern. You have to go out to the end of the rows and come back in and, and walk down the rows. But but notionally, you you split up your samples by dividing them up to different sample points across the area that you want to sample, and that means that your samples don't all come from one area of the block or the field that you want to sample, and that helps to deal with um, the variance. And then you divide your effort within that sampling to, to collect a, a fixed number of samples from each of those locations. And so what do the results look like in this particular case? We were sampling, there were two viruses involved that are both, um, one of them that's vectored by um, tree hoppers and the other by mealybugs and you can see um, going back to the idea of that green figure that I showed you that, that different numbers of positives occurred in those different locations. So for red blotch virus there were um, three out of the five sampling sites had at least one vine infected and sample five all ten vines were infected and in the case of leaf roll virus only two of the, the sampling points had infected vines, and in one case, one inf vine was infected, and in the other case, four vines were infected. So just to show a practical example of, of um, how sampling variation can occur in practice and how to try and optimize the use of, of expensive and scarce resources. Um, if you want to evaluate how well your um, sampling is going and how well your decision um, practice is going, then you need to be prepared to collect data where you do and don't use your, your tool, your sampling methodology. In this case, this is work from trying to control uh, tomato spotted wilt virus in the Central Valley that's vectored by thrips. And in this case, um, we developed a risk index to try and predict when virus incidents would, be, um, would reach um, an economic injury level of 10%, but the economic threshold was set at an incidence of 
but those that was based on the crop value and the cost of treatment at that time. So you really need to know two things. So here we've got our um, the, the risk index that triggers um, action. And you, here's our economic threshold, 5% uh, virus incidence. And so we can really think about um, crops that fall into this area. So they've got a high risk index, but they ended up with a low virus incidence. So they're false positives. And crops in this area are false negatives. So these were crops that had a low risk index, but the crop actually ended up with a relatively high virus load. And so in order to evaluate the effectiveness of your um, economic thresholds, you need to be able to collect data along those lines to decide um, whether or not you're making good decisions based on your thresholds. Just wanted to touch on that topic because it's something, again, that gets overlooked. People often don't go back and reevaluate how, how successful threshold-based treatments are. So last topic that I want to touch on um, is this idea about whether thresholds are fatally flawed in some way. And this goes back to a paper that was written by a couple of Dutch scientists in the middle of the 90s. And Jaco and Marcel um, were actually looking at wheat populations in this paper. And they came up with this surprising result from their work, which was that when they looked at um, a very simple model of wheat population, annual wheat populations, they found out that the, the model suggested that the, the, the number of seasons in which they would apply a herbicide if they followed the recommendation wasn't dependent on how big the threshold population size was. And that seems counterintuitive, right? You would think if you if you allow a higher threshold that you would you would make fewer pesticide applications over time. And if you had a lower threshold, you would make more applications. But their results seem to suggest that, that at least for wheat populations, that's not the case. And I'm going to illustrate why in, in just a second. But their work really raises three important questions about thresholds. Again, this is more aimed at the idea of whether using thresholds across a large area can deliver like policy objectives, like an overall reduction in pesticide use. So the, here are the three important things that they found out that are surprising. First result, uh, which is in the title of their paper, the long-term frequency of control, so that's the number of years that you would apply control over the total, doesn't depend on the threshold that you set. Um, the frequency of control, so again, the number of seasons where you would apply a pesticide, only depends on two things. The efficacy of the control, so what fraction of the population is killed by the control, and the growth rate of the population when you don't control it. And then the final result, which is also unwelcome to some people, is that the threshold acts as what's called an attractor. So the thresh, the population never goes very far away from the threshold size after a long period of time. So the thresh, whatever set population size you decide your threshold is, imposing that threshold on the population causes the population to stay close to that threshold size. So you never achieve eradication, but on the flip side, the population often doesn't explode too much either. But there's an important caveat to that. If you, one thing that Jaco and Marcel didn't do was to look at the effects of environment on their results. And if you mix in a little bit of environmental variation, in other words, variability in the weather from one year to the next, then you can get the situation where you can have sudden explosions in the pest population, even though you're uh, 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 even though you're using threshold-based management. So we've spent some time recently looking at this rather surprising result in relation to management of the beet leafhopper in California. And the beet leafhopper is an important vector of 
of three different pathogens. It's an amazing insect that can carry three different things. The main one that we're interested in is, is the beet curly top virus, but it also um, can vector um, a spiroplasma and a phytoplasma, which are important in other crops. So we look in the model here at 100 years. Here's the environmental variability in those 100 years. So there's some years where the environment isn't very suitable for the beet leaf hopper, and some years where it's very suitable for the beet leaf hopper, and fewer years where it's kind of average suitability. And in the first set of results, we, we, we have a threshold of 100 hoppers. So if, if, the thresh, if the population goes above 100, then we control it. If we control it, we kill 95% of them. And if we don't control it, the population increases by a factor of 10 in that year. So we start with 500, and of course that's above the threshold, so we control it and it comes down here. And then you can see what happens for the next 100 simulated years as, the, as those two factors are imposed on the population together with some variability in the weather. And in the right-hand graph, we cut the threshold in half. So now our threshold is only 50 hoppers. And here's what the results look like. And true to what Van Ooyen and uh, Wallinga said in our um, first look at this idea, we, uh, we end up applying control to the, this insect population in exactly the same number of years over this 100-year period whether the population threshold set at 100 or at 50. And it turns out that we would do that 18 times over the course of that 100 year stretch. The other thing I want to point out to you is that, you know, if you don't think about things in the long term, that let's take this uh, 20 year period here from say year 40 to year 60. So that's 20 years, which is half a career as a scientist. If this was the real world, imagine the difference for the career of somebody who happened to start studying this insect when it was in this kind of pattern from years 40 to 60, compared with what you would conclude if you started your career here at year 70 and you were confronted with basically over a decade when the insect apparently was almost completely absent from the environment. So something to bear in mind, uh, about all of this stuff is that, that um, we get very, very short windows in the world uh, in, in a terms of a career to try and work out what's happening with all of this stuff. So um, one thing that you, models are useful for is to tell us sometimes that um, our, our perceptions of what's going on in the world are, can, be, can sometimes be quite limited and, it, and it's good to keep us humble in terms of what we can work out about the world. And at that point, I'm going to stop. So um, I'll leave you this, with this photograph of, of the team collecting uh, thrips for the TSWV project in, in Fresno County in the summertime. And if I think if there's a couple of minutes, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we do have just, I think, just a comment in the Q&A, and I'll go ahead and read it to you. Uh, in high value horticultural crops, a tank mix usually includes preventive fungicides applied regardless of what you see, plus insecticides and miticides that may or may not be along just for the ride. The most important ET is your threshold for pain. Yeah, absolutely. And and that, um, that goes along with the idea of the uh, looking at the value of the crop versus the cost of treatment. And, and in very high value crops, if you do that simple calculation, um, it almost always works out that the cost of treatment um, means that the threshold is effectively zero, which is essentially what that comment is saying, if I'm interpreting it correctly. And you're absolutely right that, you know, the, the kind of psychological pain threshold is lower than, than the, the economic threshold suggests it should be. But again, it comes down to that balance really between the value of the crop and the cost of the treatment. And in very high value crops, it's almost always the case that if you do the calculations, treatments are justified from an economic perspective. So the, the thresholds at zero or very close to zero. Okay, thank you. So I think at this point, we don't have any other questions coming in. So um, 
thank you, Neil, again, for presenting. We really appreciate your presentation. And um, so I think we're going to go ahead and close out. So again, thank you, Neil. We appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. And we hope we'll see you again at our next webinar next month. Have a great afternoon.